Now let's go ahead and think a little bit more about why price systems typically deliver high levels of efficiency. And this is a little bit tricky here because everything we've done so far assumes what we've called perfect markets. And perfect markets are ones that meet the following three criteria. So perfect markets are competitive. There are many buyers and many sellers. So no single seller is able to dominate the market and manipulate the market price, nor do a group of sellers or buyers band together to try and manipulate the market price. Perfect markets are not having externalities. Externalities are situations where there are important effects on third parties. So not only, of course, does your purchase of gasoline affect yourself, and it affects the person who sold you the gasoline, but it also potentially creates a situation of air pollution. So a perfect market is not going to happen when we have the market for gasoline, because there are going to be important effects on third parties when you burn the gasoline. And finally, perfect markets have no asymmetric information. Asymmetric information is a situation where one party to the transaction knows important information about the transaction that they conceal or have an interest to conceal from the other half of the transaction. And perfect markets are sort of a benchmark that we measure things against. It's pretty clear that they don't actually exist very often. So perfect markets do deliver maximum possible gains from trade and maximum possible economic efficiency, and there's little scope for improvement. But it's pretty clear that this does not happen a whole lot. That said, there are some markets out there that are probably reasonably close to perfect. If we looked at, say, for instance, the market for shares of Apple, those conditions are pretty close to being fulfilled. There are many buyers and many sellers for shares of Apple. There are really no important externalities. It's not that you know, someone is suffering under pollution when you buy a share of Apple or something like that. And the amount of asymmetric information that enters that market is pretty small, as long as we don't have to worry about insider trading. So some markets may be fairly close to perfect. Others are obviously pretty darn imperfect. So if we looked at something like the market for healthcare, almost all of those conditions are violated. Important to realize that every market is probably at least a little bit imperfect, but there's a really wide continuum of imperfection. And among the imperfect markets, even ones that are severely imperfect, every imperfect market is imperfect in its own way. And so if we're looking at some kind of government intervention or some sort of business opportunity to try to get rid of the inefficiency created by this imperfect market, we really have to think things through pretty carefully because the interventions which work in some markets are not going to do well in others. For instance, when we have monopoly, a violation of the competitive market assumption, we could have a situation where a price control limiting the amount the monopoly is allowed to charge is going to lead to a more efficient outcome. On the other hand, it's not clear that a price control is going to help very much in the healthcare market, where many local markets already suffer a shortage of healthcare services. And if we limit the amount people can charge, that will blunt the incentive to supply and potentially make that shortage worse. So all that said, Imperfect markets are really much more interesting than perfect markets, and interesting in two ways. They're intellectually interesting for economists, and so economists spend very little time studying markets that are reasonably close to perfect. They spend most of their time studying markets that are imperfect and trying to understand exactly what the imperfections are and how they could be fixed. Also, when there's inefficiency, Anyone who can figure out a way to eliminate the inefficiency is going to increase the total gains from trade. And if you're the person who brings that solution about as part of your business, 
that's your profit. You're going to go ahead and be able to charge people for solving their inefficiency. So two examples would be something like a homeowners association. So there are important externalities from one homeowner to another. If I paint my house, that raises my neighbor's property value because it makes the neighborhood more attractive. Or if I leave my Trans Am up on blocks and have the grass grow long, that's going to lower my neighbor's property value. In a homeowner's association, there's a set of rules that everyone is supposed to obey, and if they don't obey those rules, they get fined. And you can see how this gives homeowners protection against those externalities, or allows them to promote positive externalities like making sure everyone paints their house on a regular basis. So the innovator who started building neighborhoods that had homeowners associations, the property developer who started innovating this way, was going to create a new and more valuable product for people. Now when people buy homes, they may be members of a homeowners association, and they may know that they have protection against certain types of behavior from their neighbors, and that's valuable. Other people, of course, may not like the restriction on their freedom that comes with the homeowners association, so that's not going to be a valuable product for them. But at least for some fraction of people, it is. Likewise, if we look at something like lending and borrowing, of course, borrowers have more information about how creditworthy they are than lenders do. And so borrowers would like to be able to demonstrate that they're creditworthy to lenders. But of course, lenders are afraid of losing money. So that creates a little bit of a problem. But if you have something like the credit reporting and credit rating agencies, that potentially solves that asymmetric information because it gives borrowers a chance to demonstrate their creditworthiness because someone's keeping track of all their past behavior. Now, getting back to why markets typically deliver an efficient or relatively efficient level of economic performance, one way to think about this is that markets act as a kind of social computer, it's been called. And the idea here is that if we looked at a one-on-one -on -one bargaining situation and we asked the potential buyer to tell us what's the maximum amount you're willing to pay for this good, they would probably not give us a truthful answer. They would probably understate their maximum willingness to pay as a bargaining tactic. Likewise, if we ask sellers what's the lowest price you'd be willing to accept for your product, they probably wouldn't give us a reasonable answer or, sorry, a truthful answer either on that. They would probably say, well, I just couldn't possibly sell this for less than $50, when, of course, you know, maybe they're willing to actually be bargained down below that. So it's actually very difficult in any kind of one-on-one -on -one situation to get people to give true information about their willingness to pay and their seller costs. And typically, one-on-one -on -one information one-on-one -on -one transactions involve a lot of maneuvering and negotiating and shading the truth and so on and so forth out there. What happens when people trade in a market, though, is that people's actions reveal their marginal seller cost or their marginal buyer cost. So someone's willingness to buy or sell tells through their actions whether or not their willingness to pay is higher or lower than the market price and whether their seller cost is higher or lower than the market price. And the market essentially combines all this information and comes up with the equilibrium price that is going to lead to the efficient outcome, which is really a little bit mysterious um, and magical when you think about it. So another thing that markets do is they don't just gather information on current supply relative to current demand. They also provide information about expected future scarcity. So in particular, if a good is expected to be scarcer in the future because there will be an increase in demand or a shortfall in supply, people will expect future prices to be higher. And if future prices are higher, then people are going to want to buy now or hold their supplies back now. So prices will rise today. 
So the behavior of spot prices, the spot price is the price that's currently out there on the market right now, will tend to rise in anticipation of future scarcity. And that's actually useful. That's going to lead people to reduce consumption today so there will be more available tomorrow. This sort of dynamic is strong if the commodity is storable. If you're talking about a non-storable commodity, we can't usually directly observe future scarcity in the spot market price. But for lots of things, there are what's called futures and forward contracts, where people are agreeing to buy or sell a certain amount of the good at a certain price in the future. And the ability to buy a certain amount of the good at a certain price in the future becomes valuable if the future price is expected to be higher. So for instance, let's consider the market for oil. If oil prices are currently, say, $120 a barrel, and I buy from you the right to buy oil in the future at $120 a barrel, at first you might sort of go, okay, well, that's not very valuable. But realize that if market prices increase in the future, so that the market price of oil in the future is $200 a barrel, well now, that ability to buy oil from you at $120 is now very valuable, because I can buy oil from you at $120 when it would cost me $200 on the open market. And I could potentially maybe even resell it on the open market at that point. So that contract, that ability to buy at that future fixed price, is something that's valuable. If people expect future prices to be high, they're going to buy up these future contracts. A third question we could look at here is the behavior of options. So options are a similar sort of contract to futures and forwards. They give the option to go ahead and go through and purchase something at a fixed price at some point in the future. And they also act as a predictor of future prices. An important question in financial economics is, are market prices what we call informationally efficient? So in just the same way that we expect normal markets to gather information on current willingness to pay and current seller costs, we expect these markets also to gather information about people's beliefs about future prices. And if the market is incorporating all the information about people's beliefs about future prices, then it's what we call informationally efficient. And there's actually a lot of good evidence on this, that markets are reasonably close to informationally efficient. That doesn't mean that they're always right. It means that they represent the best consensus guess based on the information available at the time. Essentially, we're going to go ahead and think about the fact that market prices are probably reasonably accurate predictors of future scarcity in most circumstances. We'll go ahead and come to some exceptions later, but best guess is probably that the market price is about the consensus estimate. As an example of the market price as a predictor, we can go ahead and look at a specific type of financial instrument called a credit default swap. And a credit default swap essentially pays the holder if somebody goes bankrupt. So in particular, this chart shows the price for the credit default swaps on Greece's government bonds. And if you sort of have kept up with the financial news, you know that Greece went through a financial crisis and uh, more or less a national bankruptcy. And this is all measured um, relative to German um, bonds, I believe. And the idea here is this thing pays out if the Greek government goes bankrupt. And so the value of this thing depends upon people's perceptions of the Greek government going bankrupt. So when people are becoming more worried that the Greek government will go bankrupt, this thing's going to increase in price. If they become less worried that the Greek government is going to go bankrupt, this becomes less valuable and they're willing to pay less. And you can see that 
Well, in the run-up to Greece's actual bankruptcy, this thing increased in price as people began to be more and more sure that the Greek government actually was going to go bankrupt. Often, people blame speculators for driving prices up. But it's important to remember that only a speculator that's correct about future scarcity is actually going to make money. If a speculator is wrong about future scarcity and future prices don't actually increase, they will have bought high and sold low. And so they will have actually hurt themselves. Last here, prices are going to act as an incentive. It's great that prices generate information, but if nobody had any incentive to pay attention to that information, prices wouldn't do very much to increase economic efficiency. But of course, prices do act as incentives. They act as incentives both for buyers and sellers. And the higher the price of a good, the more careful we are in using it and demanding it. So if we want people to, say, use water more efficiently, we could sort of politely ask them to or try to make them feel bad about using too much water or something like that. Or we could just raise the price of water. And if the price of water is higher, people will use less of it. And if the price of gasoline is higher, people will use less of it. Essentially, people self-ration based upon the price. And if the market price is an accurate reflection of the marginal value of the product, then they're going to self-ration correctly. On the other side of it, prices give sellers an incentive to actually produce the goods. The price tells the seller how much people value the product. And so a higher price tells sellers this product has become more valuable to people at the margin. So you might want to invest more resources into producing it, and it gives people the right profit incentive to do that.